coming up on Smart Tech Today. Uh, I'm going to stop you right there. If you are not subscribed to the show, please go ahead and click that subscribe button. Share the show with your friends. It helps us every single step of the way. All the Twitch shows, get out there, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, whatever button it happens to be, and do that. As for this show, we are going to be talking today about an exciting new project from Polaroid. It's the Polaroid Now camera. It's finally coming to fruition. So exciting. Uh, plus a new study in partnership with the Aura Ring, that's that one that Leo Laporte wears, to try and do early detection of coronavirus symptoms. Uh, YouTube is also dropping its streaming quality for the sake of uh, everybody streaming from home. And we are seeing a lot of changes coming to those auto platforms, Android Auto plus CarPlay. So you'll see some updates there. Plus lots about Apple, lots about Google, and lots about voice assistants before we round things out with our picks of the week and the projects we're working on, like this little band that buzzes me. Stay tuned. We've got a lot to cover on Smart Tech Today. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hello and welcome back to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am Micah Sargent. And I am Matthew Casnelli. Yeah, you are. Oh, yeah. As <laughs> usual. As uh, as is standard, and we do uh, appreciate the fact that you are. Matthew Casanelli. Um, well, folks, we have an episode in store for you today, uh, as we do try to every week on Mondays. So we do appreciate you being here with us. And uh, let's let's get started. So some of you may have noticed that different uh, streaming services have been limiting bandwidth. And they are doing that in the interest of making sure that everybody that's online can stay online and be online and maintain onlineness, despite the fact that everybody else is also online. You got a lot of kids uh, doing online school right now, um, more people working from home than ever. And so YouTube uh, is, is reducing its video quality over the next month. Now, Matthew, you are the um, YouTube expert amongst the, at least the two of us. And so do you <laughs> want to tell us a little bit more about this? Uh, what What's going on? What does it mean in terms of how uh, folks are going to interact with YouTube and all that jazz? Um, yeah, basically on all of your mobile devices, I think it'll default to 480p, which is pretty low. Um, so if you are watching the replay of this on YouTube, it might be a little lower quality than normal. But um, basically, they're just doing it because it'll complete, it'll significantly like reduce the load on the internet over time. Um, and I, I think I even noticed that I've been watching Mad Men on Netflix, and like it's very clearly pixelated and worse quality right now, but. It's also like, I think I saw other stories that are like record video chats going on at the same time and things like that. So it makes sense. But it's just a kind of a follow up from last week that Disney Plus is doing it, which also is now out in the UK, which is cool. But um, overall, it's not the crisp, high quality uh, footage that you're used to. So just for now, at least um, we'll see how long it lasts a month, at least for now. But I guess we're all supposed to be social distancing even more. So who knows how long that'll last. Yeah, I might continue to go. Now, with that, I think it's important that we keep in mind that, you know, the, these are the default settings, and so you can up them. Um, but I guess my suggestion, my plead would be that uh, if it's something that you don't need to see in 100% crisp, clean 4K quality, maybe you skip out on seeing it in 100% crisp, clear uh, 4K. It's almost like in California, how uh, when the drought comes around, 
we have uh, the, the, the plea that folks use less water or at least be mindful of their water. I think the same thing applies with uh, bandwidth. You know, be mindful of your bandwidth. And if you don't need to brush your teeth for seven minutes, which in this case is turning on 4K video quality, uh, then maybe, you know, don't don't do that, especially when it comes to video conferencing and stuff like that. Outside of, of course, the shows, we want to have the best quality possible. But when we're doing our group chats to plan for the week or what have you, you don't necessarily need to see your coworker in uh, 4K, 8K quality. Um, perhaps that could be something that you skip out on. <laughs> see every single pore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, that, that reminds me of a quote from The Office. Um, I, I, all I can focus on are how giant your... Uh, I can't remember how it goes. Never mind. Forget it. Jim's I can't remember it. Oh, oh gosh, I'm getting zoomed in on. Um, yeah, Jim's pores on his nose. Uh, <laughs> how big and gross the pores on your nose are. That's it. Um, now, there is a new company. Well, it's not a new company, rather. It's a new study. Uh, but it's by the, the folks that make Aura Rings. So Aura Rings, I know that... Um, dear friend and fellow host on Twit, Leo Laporte has an Aura ring. He's been wearing his. Um, but Aura is doing a new study um, to basically track uh, temperatures and use it as a way to identify coronavirus or rather COVID-19 cases early. So early detection of coronavirus cases. I think this is pretty cool. Um, we already have, and I'm trying to remember... Uh, what they're called. Da, 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 da. It's a thermometer company, also a yeah. company that um, Leo. Yeah, Ken's. Yeah, Kinsa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so Kinsa uh, Health, you can go to Kinsa, K I N S A Health.co, is also doing something similar. It's not a study per se, but they are doing uh, what's called the health weather map. And so as folks are taking their temperature, um, Kinsa Insights is determining how uh, the, the sort of weather of the, uh, the temperatures of, of folks across the United States looks. So it's a pretty neat thing that they're doing there. Um, and this kind of seems to be along the same lines with uh, the Aura Ring. Yeah, it's solid. It's like... Uh they're partnering with UCSF right now to determine if this can actually be used. So it's not like a complete, like if you buy an Uber ring, you can detect ahead of time or something like that. But there it's, uh, and also for anybody who doesn't know, it basically just monitors your health by like being a ring around your finger that you can, it'll track it persistently, which is, I think the most important thing is like consistent data over time. Mm -hmm. I'm also really glad you said it first because I was going to say Ura ring. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's <laughs> one of those things I've read a hundred times but never actually said out loud. <laughs> that is the ring for the military. Ura ring. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, this is, is, it's my understanding that it's the, the Aura ring. Um, so this is, this is exciting. Um, this is a ring that I've looked at in the past. They're a little pricey for sure, but they do more than just track uh, your temperature. They track activity. They track sleep. They track all these kinds of different things. Um, and it's all built into this nice little ring that is uh, able to be charged on a little device. So it's a pretty neat little tool that can be used. And I love these different companies that are using different methods to track uh, and help catalog all sorts of stuff related to this novel coronavirus related to COVID-19. We've seen quite a few companies um, working to uh, map the what genetic structure of this novel coronavirus. Yeah. We've seen uh, a bunch of folks, you know, looking at the, the different symptoms and trying to keep track of those. And we've seen companies um, working to make it easier for individuals to determine if they are experiencing symptoms of the uh, disease. So it's, it's kind of, in that sense, it's been very neat seeing how the companies are coming together to uh, help. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, let's see. I, I was this gonna, is, this, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, this is a great way to take care of your health, but in a different angle. Um, it's a story from Mashable and I've seen tweets calling for a similar thing is it might be good to turn off your screen time notifications right now, especially if you happen to be going on social media for 
I don't know, like 24 hours a week or something like that. <laughs> not that that's, I just pulled that number out of thin air and not from my own stats uh, oh at all. Oh my. Uh, <laughs> it's only like three and a half hours a day. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just thought it's a good tip because most people don't really need to see right now. It's like, oh yeah, you're spending even more time on your phone. Maybe you should like, I don't know. It's just like, keep it, keep relaxed and don't get any more negative influence if you don't need That's it. That's the thing, right? We we don't need to be doing any beating ourselves up right now because sort of the world is beating us up enough <laughs> um, as it stands. Mother Nature is taking care of it. So with that, and regardless of what device you have, you know, Android has its own sort of screen tracking or, or use tracking platform. I can mm-hmm. see why folks are suggesting to to turn that off. If you look at that and it ends up bumming you out, then yeah, I will say that it's actually been um, a tool that's been very good for me because it in many ways shows the difference between uh when what spending time with people does to reduce my screen time versus in a situation where you're not spending time with people. And so sort of looking at how I have not let the screen time affect my ability to spend time with people in the past um, has been a positive. But yeah, I I think we have plenty of ways that we are being... um, regulated and controlled and and this is not necessarily one that we need but you know ultimately it's up to you how you feel it impacts you because i think for some people it is not that big of an impact and for others it can be kind of a bummer uh one that results in sadness so yeah yeah. exactly just check in with yourself i guess be self-aware in that sense uh Uh, one of my early tips for uh just like taking care of yourself was to just like if you are going to read twitter all day long like do it on a screen that's vertical and ergonomic and not just like i will notice i'll be like man why do i feel terrible and i'm like laying on my couch like upside (laughs) down with and i've been there for like oh like two hours and it's like hmm yeah it's uh man the it's the world getting me down it's like no you can also like just take it take care of yourself if you if you're gonna binge it do it ergonomically (laughs) posture check Yeah, exactly. All right, everybody. Check your posture right now. (laughs) All right. If you feel like you're sitting up, shoulders back, do one of these little shoulder rolls right now while you're listening to the show. There you go. Now you're feeling good. Rock your head to the left. Rock your head to the right. You can grasp (laughs) your your head and pull it a little bit. Ah, Get that nice stretch in. There we go. And release. (laughs) And then we'll switch sides here. Okay. And pull relax while you're doing it. Try not to have any tension. Let it just naturally elongate and release. There we go. (laughs) Ah, are we feeling good? The blood's flowing. Oh man, I know I feel better. And I'm so excited. This is a good opportunity to use my uh, show me this clip shortcut because we just had the video feed rotating as (laughs) Micah did the stretches, which is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you gotta gotta watch it so you can uh, participate. You know what? I may have to talk to my fellow co-hosts about working in some sort of um, stretch time during (laughs) a longer show. Uh, (laughs) But let's let's move on to the next thing. This is something I'm super pumped about uh, whenever I saw this. So TechCrunch put together an article talking about the history of Polaroid and the impossible project. So Polaroid, of course, great, awesome, fun company that created cameras that had instant film. So you could take a photo with your Polaroid camera, you get the little film out, everybody thought you needed to shake it back and forth uh, to make the camera or the photo develop faster. So you may remember doing that little shakety, shakety, shakety to get the, the photo to develop. And then you had this nice instant photo available to you that you could hang or whatever you wanted to do with it. Well, Polaroid sort of went away in the era of digital cameras and now phones that take photos. Uh, But the Impossible Project wanted to keep that going. So the Impossible Project, uh, the folks jumped in and leased the the building that Polaroid could no longer lease, the manufacturing uh, facility, to create Polaroid film. 
and continue to create it. But the problem was they didn't have a lot of the other stuff, the IP, the uh, patents, all that kind of information. And so it really was kind of an impossible project. They worked very hard on making it happen still. And they pretty much recreated the Polaroid film in a new way, released a camera that worked for it, etc. But now, um, oh, and, and I should mention that Polaroid in the midst of all of this was trying to exist sort of as a, just an, uh, a ghost brand, almost a brand that could attach itself to whatever. So they worked mm-hmm. with Lady Gaga. They worked with all these different things. They released all these different, uh, product products and it didn't really work out that well. But <laughs> finally, Polaroid and the Impossible Project have come together right now, and they are creating the Polaroid Now camera with Polaroid film, and it's going to be awesome. It's a $99 camera that can do autofocus. It can do double exposure. Uh, If you've ever seen a Polaroid with double exposure, you know how cool they can look. It can do a self-timer like the old school Polaroids, and it has a flash that has a built-in sort of monitor. It's kind of like how the flash works on iPhone or Android devices on smartphones in general, where the flash will change based on um, what it's taking a photo of. So all of those things come together, and then $99.99 for the camera itself, uh, and you can do Polaroids again. <laughs> I'm really yeah. pumped about this. I'm so excited. I, as I was saying to Matthew before the start of the show, I wish that, um, financially things weren't tumultuous because I would have already bought one of these cameras if that was the case. I remember Polaroids so fondly. Uh, I, I don't know about you, Matthew, but I still have Polaroids hanging around from my mm-hmm. very early youth, uh, that I, cherish to this day. And there's something just about that, the, the way that the Polaroid camera, the way that the Polaroid film develops that photo. It's just, it's unique. It's beautiful. And I, yeah, I don't know this. It would make me very happy to own this camera for sure. Yeah. They're legit. I, I have an Instax, which is like kind of the, I think they're a competitive brand that kind of came out in lieu of Polaroid, not doing much until this point. Um, mm-hmm. so it'll be interesting yeah, to the see. Fuji. How- Fujifilm one. Yeah. Um, and I also, I've, I've had my eye too in the past on Polaroid has other cool stuff. Like they have a, it's called a lab instant printer. And what you can actually do is like put your phone on top of this little printer thing and it'll like take a picture of your phone screen and then print it out as a Polaroid. So it's kind of a way to make digital photos into Polaroids. Um, but this is a little more traditional camera style, but it is cool. It's like, and the new Polaroid is back. Drop the, it. drop the, the, <laughs> just Polaroid. <Yeah>. Polaroid is back. <laughs> and it comes in green, folks. It yeah, comes they're in very green. colorful too. Like, what is it? Yellow, red, orange, green, blue, black, and silver. So pretty solid. Yeah. Just like, I'll, I will admit at a certain point, it's, it can be like hipster and cool just to have one and it looks cool and stuff like that. But also they're sold out like, of the they're green. They're great. Like, I like the, um. I think, is it Casey Neistat who has like, he in his old uh, studio thing that he did, like he had a wall of Polaroids of everybody who ever visited kind of thing. That's yeah, there's a nice so many physical things you can way do to like, it. yeah, exactly. Man, I, I just, I'm looking longingly and I have to resist. <laughs> I have to resist. Man, I really want the green one though and they're sold out right now. So maybe that's good for me. Um, yeah. Because I won't be able to get one until the group. Well, I could, but I don't want to. So I'll just wait till I get the email notification that says, hey, green's back in stock. And then maybe uh, we'll be in a better situation at that point. I can get one. Uh, very cool. You can head to, well, we'll include links in the show notes to check out the Polaroid now. But you can also just look up Polaroid now, do a search for that. Um, and I recommend reading that TechCrunch article because, like I said, it shows you uh, the whole sort of history of, of where they've come from. Where did they come from? Where did they go? Et cetera. <laughs> All right, what's next for us, Matthew? We have got some CarPlay Android Auto updates, Um, even though generally not particularly useful at the moment because hopefully nobody is driving around too much and staying at home. But um, basically Google has expanded Android Auto to 16 more countries um, because, oh, up to to 34 total because basically they just hadn't rolled it out yet. 
So new countries are Aust- Australia, Austria, Germany, France, India, Ireland, Italy, New Zealand, Philippines, Singapore, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Switzerland, Taiwan, and the UK. Um, and this is also Android Auto Wireless. So I guess right now Japan and Russia are the only places where they don't have it available, probably due to like legal restrictions and things like that. Um, but this is just like I am commenting on this because I'm jealous because I don't know of very many vehicles at all that have wireless uh, CarPlay right now. So this is one area where... We're waiting patiently for Apple to make it more available, although it is like a whole thing with car manufacturers, which makes it a little bit more difficult to update. Hmm. Have you tried uh, Android Auto too much? Yes. So uh, every time I've had uh, the chance to use CarPlay, which is every time I've had to rent a... Oh, don't touch your face. Every time I've had a chance to rent a vehicle, um, I have used... Uh, Android Auto as well, just to give it a go. Um, and I think that they're both pretty pretty similar. Um, I like that Android Auto can be used. It's something I wish iPhone or iOS would do, Apple would do, is that you can activate Android Auto on an Android phone. And so you can put your Android phone up in you know, your dock, turn it to its side so it's in landscape mode, turn on Android Auto, and it works right there on the device. You don't have to have the car that has it built in. And I just I wish CarPlay would do this. I wish they'd do yeah. the same with CarPlay. We've got these phones. Why not? Um, so, yeah, I've used both. And I think, I mean, they're both pretty similar. Um, and so... Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm glad that it's coming to more countries. I think that those services, those uh, unique uh, pared down versions of the operating system are 100% better than um, using the full on operating system in any case. Mm -hmm. Although, as we saw last week, it's still not good. (laughs) Don't don't use your interface if you're driving too much uh, and do it in between. Yeah locations i would say i would say that is in my opinion all that is 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 uh folks i think you should familiarize yourself with the system before you start using it and the point is to be able to do it hands-free um you need to use the system hands-free as it's designed as opposed to keeping your eyes on the screen and going oh how do i do this what do i tap tap tippity tap no the point is to use it hands-free uh keep it as it's designed to provide for a distraction-free interaction. <clears throat> yep. Um, and then the other um, update was that uh, CarPlay is now it's now possible for third-party apps to integrate with the sort of dashboard feature that they have. So if you're like navigating, you can hit an additional button and it'll show the map plus like your calendar and the current music all at the same time. Um, and until this point, it's only worked with Apple Maps. But the, the catch is they opened it up to third parties, but Google Maps and Waze haven't updated to take advantage of it yet. So I'm not sure if Google, they can sometimes take their time adopting the latest uh, Apple features. But at the same time, it is like they want to make sure, like we just said, that it's working properly and everything like that. So look soon for Google Maps and Waze in the little advanced car play screens. Uh, so I have to say I'm a little bit ignorant <laughs> when it comes to uh, Apple's placement and lack of placement. And so I had no idea that Apple didn't exist. Uh, Apple's app store didn't exist in some of the countries that it is now expanding to, including Iraq, Afghanistan, and uh, 18 others, is it? Um Mm -hmm. And then apparently they are working on making available, making uh, the app store available in 177 countries or regions by the end of the year. So, yeah, this is this is exciting. Morocco, Rwanda. I heard of those. (laughs) Um, And so they're going to be coming to it. Rather, Apple is going to be coming to quite a few of these places. Yeah, that's a good it's a good update. Is I mean, like, like you said, I wasn't even necessarily aware that they weren't in these countries, but it is just like great to see technology like this coming to more countries around the world, especially when it really can have such an impact in your life and during times where maybe you're socially isolated or things like that. I'm not sure how much those countries specifically are are doing isolation, but 
just in general, it is like the App Store will be in many more countries around the world at the end of the year, which is nice. Yeah, good golly. We take these things for granted, I think. Um, Seriously. <laughs> I, cer- I certainly do. Uh, yeah, the Maldives, or is it the Maldives? Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Cameroon, Kosovo, uh, Libya, Montenegro, Morocco, Mozambique, Myanmar, Rwanda, Tonga, Zambia. I'm not going to pronounce that one. I was going to say other ones. Right. You'll get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. But yeah, we have all these apps and <laughs> get to download all these ones that we want to download and use all the ones we want to use. And there's some countries that don't have that. Um, I'm curious what the spread of each of the app stores look like. And I say each, meaning Google's uh, Google Play Store and Apple's App Store and where some are and some aren't. And I'm curious if there's overlap or if some have more reach and some have less. So I think I might have to look into because I'm curious about that. Yes. We will follow uh, up with that in a future episode. Yeah, sure. we'll have to do that. Let me write that in the document. Hey, dumb um, dumb dumb, already follow up. I already beat you to it. Oh, you got <laughs> me to it. All right. Uh, let's talk about the next one. I gave this playlist a listen the other day and... It was okay. Uh, I, I'm overall, I'm kind of always disappointed with Apple's um, built-in playlists, but they've just add, it's just added a new one uh, that is supposed to be sort of to to get up and go, get you rolling. It's called the Get Up with an exclamation point <laughs> mix. Um, so you know, get up. What is? Uh, were you happy with yours? Yeah, I'd say so. I uh, I listened to it last week, and then I think it updates every Sunday. And so this time it played, uh, I think it's Down For What by Drake, which is not <gasps> typical of my listening <laughs> habits. But I think I got I think I got into that song when it first came out because I saw like some video of like a group of guys just dancing to it, and they were having a blast. And so every time it's in my head, it is like it's a great get up and go song. So it it worked this morning on me at least. Um, but yeah, here I like some, they have. Oh, what? I was just gonna say, here's some of mine. Um, I'm seeing someone here that I've never heard of. Someone here that I would rather not hear. Um, let's oh, see. Yeah, this is the life. That's a good two door cinema club song. Oh yeah, exactly. Mike has got a fancy on screen version of his phone that I'm super jealous of because I need to do this for my live streams. But watch, I'm scrolling, 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 and it's scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, that Lola song by Mika is fantastic. That's a good choice. Oh, nobody's business is okay, except it has Chris Brown in it, and he's not a good person. Um, fake Mine you out. started with uh, Rehash by the Gorillas, which is like an old, I wouldn't say old school song, but it's um, it's got like a sweet bass line right at the beginning, which is a good for mm-hmm. getting up in the day. Yeah, I do think mine could be a little bit better, but I have that same problem just in general with services like this because I think there's like a mix of... I used to listen to a lot of music that I don't necessarily want anymore. And Mm -hmm. I feel like there's like a weird, like middle area of music that I like that it doesn't play for me. Um, But I actually, in the past, back in the workflow days, I um, made what you can now download as a shortcut that keeps a master list of these mixes. Because I always was like, I love this music, but I want more than just the music that they give me each week. I want like the running list of everything oh. they've ever recommended to me. And so I have this huge shortcut that you're supposed to create like a master get up a mix and then you can run this and every week it'll like update that or you can play from your mixes and things like that. Um, I wish I wish that you could do, have shortcuts that run on their own automatically. Yeah, I mean you can do Having that. Remember yeah. that is kind of. Yeah, exactly. Like you could have the automation right now pop up and tell you to run it. And I, w- I, w- I was looking for that exact thing because of this playlist in the home automations, but you can't add to a playlist with a home automation or anything. Um, Darn it. That's definitely an era that or an area that Apple needs to improve in iOS 14, I'd say, because for a lot of people, the automations that they added aren't automatic and so they just like aren't as useful as you would if you could use them all the time or something like that yeah hmm. well maybe they'll they'll do that soon uh this is you know another thing that that 
I certainly keep an eye on this list. Uh, Apple keeps a list of HomeKit enabled accessories on their website, uh, a running list that shows products that are currently available, products that are announced, and products that are coming soon. And so you can scroll through the list and all the different categories of HomeKit enabled accessories are available. And you can see, you know, what products you might want to check out. So there are new ones, including a new doorbell, a new smart plug, and a heater, uh, which is is new and interesting. So this is um, the Arc Heater, and it is a UK-based uh, heating company, uh, but it will provide you. It will provide control of the uh, heating system via HomeKit, so that you can say, um, you know, Siri, I'm uh, I'm getting a little cold in here, and uh, I could really use some heat. And uh, then it will go ahead and turn on for mm-hmm. you and warm you up. So kind of nice, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Get that fire going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining if you actually gave your request to. Your smart assistant like that. Yeah, could you uh, <laughs> maybe uh, turn the lights on, please? That'd be great. It's worth noting that the Arc heater also works with Amazon's Alexa and the Google Assistant as well. Uh, what are some of the other ones that Apple has added to the list? Uh, there is a video doorbell from Yobi, Yobi the B3. Um, so it's Another one of those in there with 1080p video, infrared night vision, two-way audio, and weather resistance. They're calling and it's it not, a world-class. <laughs> Sorry? It's not that horrible uh, doorbell camera company that we all know and love. So that's <laughs> kind of a plus in my book. Um, yeah, but that's currently, it's on listing, but it's not released yet. And we'll see if they do a HomeKit secure video. Um, yeah, but then there's another entry into the smart plug market, which is... Uh, the MSS 110 HK smart plug mini from Maros. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So great, great branding there. Um, what but a they're great basically name. like a new, they have a outdoor plug that they set up last year, but basically this is a new brand that maybe we'll be seeing more come in the future. It is like, there's a whole, it's still so surprising to me when we first started the show, I never would have thought that we'd have like home kit news almost every single week, but <laughs> maybe we just started at the right time because it is like up until that point, it seemed like there was barely any new products and stuff is like slowly more and more coming out, which is great to see. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I thought even that we wouldn't have enough news in general. Um, I've wanted to do a show like this for a really long time and I myself had the concern and folks that I pitched the idea to had the concern that there wouldn't be enough news. And there's so much news. There's always so much news each week available to talk about, um, which is exciting that there's always new stuff coming. And speaking of new stuff coming, I've got to figure this out because uh, the Logitech Circle 2 camera, that's the camera that I always uh, wax ecstatic about, has a new firmware update out that adds occupancy sensors and light sensors to your HomeKit setup. Now, this is interesting because I opted to update my firmware early on the Logitech Circle 2 in order to add HomeKit secure video. But by doing so, I essentially separated the camera from its uh, server that allowed for new firmware updates. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious now, given that there is this new update uh, to the firmware, if I can then essentially re-enroll in the firmware, uh, what is it that I'm looking for, route or process, and sort of get back into the the scheme of things, or if I'm kind of stuck now Mm -hmm. in this this, uh, sort of jumping off point that I took. So yeah, (laughs) we'll see. I, I haven't tried it yet. This was news to me. Um, as much as it is news to all of you, um, because I thought that for sure, you know, Logitech was kind of saying, hey, you've got this way or this way. So the fact that they've announced this kind of runs contrary to the um, information that they've been presenting so far about it. Hmm. Yeah, that is, that would suck if you got stuck in one spot or the other. I'm yeah, trying I think to look I'll, at the, oh, yeah, the process is still a one way well. conversion. You will no longer be able to set it up. Ooh, <laughs> I hope See? that doesn't apply yeah. to you. Uh, uh, maybe 
time to get a second one for research purposes. So I don't know. But see, but that's general, so stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hope. Um, I mean, we had seen the room me service has Siri shortcuts for occupancy sensors. That's a hard sentence to say. Um, but now it's it'll be integrated into HomeKit. So that is very interesting because I want to see more of that of like, am I in this room or something? Although now that I think about it, I don't want to put a security camera in my office just to be able to see if I'm in here or not. So hmm. we'll see. Yeah. I hope you get that going because that would be a shame otherwise. Yeah, I'd be a little peeved <laughs> um, if I can't update to the latest version here. So uh, we'll see how how this all plays out for sure. Um, so we'll follow up on that. Okay, this is a great great piece, Matthew, and I think that um, you're doing you're doing good work <laughs> by by <laughs> keeping people from having to if they don't want to. Uh, keeping them from having to stay up with the news. So let's let's yeah. uh, tell us about this. Sure. I should have put this earlier too with the smart or the screen time notifications. But it's basically I came across this article from TechHive where they were like, you know, if you have a Echo Show or a Google or Nest Home Hub right now, maybe you don't want to see headlines of the day showing up throughout the day. And that's like new update on total cases of coronavirus or something like that. Um, so it's just a pretty simple guide of just showing you how to go in and turn that off. Uh, on the Echo Show, it's like settings, home and clock, home content, and then you can switch off the trending topics. And then on the Google or Nest Hub or Nest Hub Max, it's like setting, learn more, recognition and personalization, how personal results appear, and then never show the news proactively. So it can be a little bit buried in their settings, but it's nice to look through if you maybe just don't want to see that in your face and instead set up something like nice pictures of your family. <laughs> oh, I agree. Uh, it can be. I mean, I have been using the headlines that fly by to remain lightly updated. I like that sort of uh, passive update that then I can choose if I want to delve deeper into, but I don't have to if I, if I choose not to. So it provides the perfect amount of filtration for me in a way because it's I can take action if I want to or I can leave it where it is as opposed to some of the more uh, forceful means of, of, you know, the the headline notifications that you might get on your phone or something like that. You're only seeing them when you're around these devices. And I, I quite like that, that, you know, I'm walking into a room and I happen to look at the uh, show that's on my kitchen counter or what have you. And at that point, I see a few headlines fly by and then I move on to something else. Um, I'm interested. I got to get one of those shows because I have the Nest Hub, but... I have just been, it's like I want that little ambient news and information all around. Uh, that's just Yeah, I it's guess. nice to have it in, well, I mean, for me, I've got it. I've got one that's in my uh, master bathroom and the Logitech show, the Logitech show, the Echo show has a physical switch to turn off the camera. <laughs> uh, it quite literally covers the camera. So I have it in my bathroom, but the camera button, the camera is always closed and turned off. Um, and the reason why is because it's nice to have a clock in my bathroom uh, that I can also ask the time if I'm in the shower and it's fogged over and I can't see, you know, through the glass or whatever. Um, and so having that in there, you know, when I'm washing my hands after using the restroom, I can see the time. I can also ask, uh, by the, this is a little pro tip. If you haven't done that yet, ask your echo devices to, um, play a, I think it's a, I think you say play a hand washing song. Um, mm. and it's this horribly stupid, horribly <laughs> dumb little rap that that uh alexa does but it's kind of adorable and it, it made me smile it was funny um but anyway you know right. washing your hands and you get to see a few of those headlines and then i come downstairs and i happen across the you know happen to glance at the one that's on my uh, counter in the kitchen and so yeah there are a few places where i can see that ambient headlines and i find that much better than getting you know new york times and cnn blasts on my phone that i'd rather not pay attention to uh mm -hmm. because they're you know, right there. Boom, boom, boom. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I feel, uh, about that. But this next topic is something that we, uh, we being Leo Laporte and I have had talked on iOS today this past week. Um, we record that show on Tuesdays. We record it live on Tuesdays, publish on Tuesdays as well. Um, but 
there is a sort of conversation going around a study that went out that looked at the voice assistants, um, some of the voice assistants and used African American vernacular English, which is a form of English, um, that is specific to, in many cases, specific to African Americans, to black people. Um, and it is a unique form of English uh, that is recognized linguistically across, you know, many, um, I don't know, bodies of education, I guess you would say, or many linguistic bodies as mm -hmm. a true form of English um, and as a vernacular. And the study is suggesting that AAVE African American vernacular English is not something that voice assistants can understand very well. It's important to note that this study did not use real full shipping versions of the uh, voice assistants. They used a developer package um, that did not have the full and complete constantly updated and, you know, tied to the server, the AI servers uh, version of the voice assistants. And so it does not speak to the true full um, understandability <laughs> of, of the voice assistants. But regardless of that, Regardless of that, I do think that this is something that uh, we have to pay attention to, particularly given the fact that AAVE has, studies have shown, has resulted in the unfair and unlawful uh, incarceration of, of African Americans or any folks who speak uh, AAVE. And so if it can be an issue where African-American vernacular English can result in incarceration and things like that, then if it's that extreme, I think we also have to focus on these less extremes as well, where if I just want to use a voice assistant um, and, you know, these voice assistants pride themselves on being able to understand different languages, then it's important that they also understand subsets of languages. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like the, in the study, they were saying that 19% of the time, the interviews with white, pe with white people had errors, but 35% of the time that happened during the interviews with black people. So it's like a 15% difference of just getting it constantly wrong when you're asking it for something. Again, like you said, it's not like the full Siri experience or something like that, but it is like these tools are not trained properly on like a wide variety of data sets and they're calling specifically for them to train it more with African American vernacular English, which is, I think it's great. I have seen, I mean, there is some yeah. stuff that's like the headlines you might see. I think another article was like, no, Siri isn't racist. There's more to it than that. Um, but it is like, it's incredibly important because I know this isn't, doesn't have anything, anything to do with race, but I've have heard of other people who are like constantly turning Siri off because it has such a bad hit rate um, for, I think it was non-English speakers, but Again, it's not just about foreign languages. It's about different dialects within language, too. Very well put. Yeah, so I'm really excited about this next story. Google Podcasts has rolled out uh, a new design, new features, new stuff, and it also launched on iOS. And um, I'm excited to say that you should definitely check out uh, the latest episode of Tech News Weekly because Jason Howell and I, this will be episode number 126, Jason Howell and I talked to Zach renault Wedeen, who is the founder and the current product manager of Google Podcasts. So the guy in charge of all of Google Podcasts came on the show. We got to talk to him about um, the new discovery features in Google Podcasts, as well as the fact that it is now launched on iOS. I have downloaded it. I have subscribed to Smart Tech Today and other shows, uh, and I'm checking it out to see about its recommendation features and things like that. Um, Renoa Dean put together a blog post on Google's site uh, that sort of talks about his experience discovering new podcasts and what he wanted from Google Podcasts in order to improve upon that experience. So it's a great uh, article there that you should check out. And uh, I'm curious, Matthew, have you played around with Google Podcasts at all and the new Google Podcasts on iOS? And does it have 
Siri shortcuts uh, <laughs> options. Oh, I forgot about the shortcuts part. Um, I was playing around with it, but um, it's, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's a podcast app with a feed and then you can search for shows and subscribe to them and everything. Um, so it seems it's like a nice design. I definitely like it. I'll look forward to it being included in the list of make sure to like and subscribe on Apple podcasts <laughs> and wherever you get your podcasts kind of thing. Right. Um, the but very yeah. long list. Do they have? Yeah. Shorts on um, I, like I said, I've tried it out. The one thing that is a little tough with it is if the, the focus, Renoa Dean kind of pointed out, their focus is on people who have not really been in podcasts before. On iOS, mm -hmm. it's kind of easier to get into podcasts. He even, you know, made this note because uh, Apple makes that front of mind. But on Google's Android platform up to this point, you kind of had to go out and get a podcast application and do that. And so they're really trying to bring in new podcast listeners. And so with that in mind, uh, they're not necessarily focused on folks who already exist in the podcast space. So there's not an import feature. Um, and so mm -hmm. they're kind of working on ways of looking at that. So I did have to just sort of go in and search myself to try and find it, uh, find different shows to subscribe to. Uh, it doesn't currently support video. Um, so for folks who listen to video podcasts, that might be a concern that you have. Uh, but in any case, it is a really uh, interesting take on podcasting and Google's search functionality and ability to yeah. use its AI smarts and machine learning smarts to provide for uh, episode recommendations, I think is going to be really fascinating. So I'm looking at it for that to see if it can point out new shows that I might want to check out. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Just their Google abilities and like discovery and stuff like that should be interesting. Um, plus just the ability if you are a Google Home user to play it from your speaker and then play back in the same app and experience there. So that should be good. It is like everybody's got their own little platforms now. So, I mean, it is, it's almost wild to think that they are just now adding. I mean, they've had like a web version before, but Apple is like the invention of podcasts <laughs> with the iPod yeah. and everything like that. So, right. So, it, or I mean, I guess maybe they get more credit for it just because of that branding. Um, but yeah, it is like a, there's, uh, lots of Google updates because they also have the redesign for the Google Assistant. So if you are in the Google Assistant world, this was a good week of updates. Um, they have like now a redesign feed that's just like a series of cards and um, a lot more simple to use the uh, Assistant app itself. Um, I did notice when I opened mine that it showed me tomorrow's weather and then the next five bills that I have to pay from my Gmail and oh, wow. I did not, I did not want to see that. I was like, <laughs> screw that. It's like, uh, just so you know, here's when money's going to go out of your account. I would, I did think that was very surprising. I was like, I mean, it was useful information and I don't like, I usually put that stuff on my calendar. And so, but I did like the awareness that's like when those were happening, but it was maybe just in this particular moment when the economy is a little tumultuous <laughs> seeing you know, all your upcoming bills. And that's the only yeah. information is like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> uh, um, and also this is not just iOS. This rolled out on Android last week. So it's just kind of like the new Google experience or assistant experience. Cool. Cool. Uh, well, that takes care of the news for this week. Let's talk uh, a little bit about the, the projects that we've been working on. So I promised that I would uh, talk about as soon as I got it and had it in my hands, the Immu Touch band. This was the uh, $50 band that uh, upon wearing it and setting it up with, with the, excuse me, upon wearing it and calibrating it, you could then um, make it so that it vibrates every time you go to touch your face. It comes with that nice NATO style band. Uh, and this middle contraption has the sensors and vibration motor in it. And then upon wearing it, if you, and I can, let me see if I can get it to, I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, very nice. well. uh, yeah, I heard that. Yeah. So it's got a little uh, vibration motor in it. Um, let me see. I'll pull up the amp here. Da, da, da. So it's an app that's available on both Android and iOS and it lets you um, calibrate. So it already, I, you know, you just have to have Bluetooth turned on. Um, and I tap calibrate and then I set different touch points. So I touch my face in one of those spots 
and then while wearing the band and then I tap add touch point and then it knows that that's a place that I don't want mm. to be touching. And as soon as my hand with the band on my hand moves into that spot, then it will, you know, adjust accordingly or will vibrate accordingly. Um, you can alter the, the settings so that it will, uh, pause, uh, after vibrating. So, um, you know, it, essentially there's a, a pause vibration option. And so that way it doesn't bug you as much. So for five minutes, it will stop bugging you. And then the trigger time. So length of time you can touch your face before it starts to bug you. Setting that low obviously will mean that you get notified quite quickly whenever yeah. you're touching your <laughs> face. So it's, it's a very simple app, um, and system. And that makes sense. I mean, it's not meant to be anything too complex, let me see if I can't, where did I put that? I've got a second, uh, I guess I don't have it near me. I, I have a second webcam, so I was going to try to do an up close look at this, uh, band itself. I think that the, this is definitely early days of production. And so it's not the most pretty device <laughs> I've ever seen, uh, to say the least. Let me grab my second webcam here. I love your notes that, in the document that we use for the show, it says, I have it now. I'm using it. It kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is uh, exactly how I feel about it. It's, I think that, you know, it, it's a mixture of things. They certainly rushed to production uh, for good reason. Uh, but also sure. it was just not, um, not what... I had hoped it was going to be um, for the cost of the product. So let me go to my second screen here. Um, so here, oh, let me get that off of the screen. Uh, there we go. And this. Okay. So you can see that it's essentially all glued together. Um, <laughs> it's wow. a metal band that they have all of the electronics in here and they're just kind of all glued together. Uh, in fact, you can kind of see the wires there, um, oh my that hold it together. Yeah. And so it's not pretty. They put it together kind of, uh, sloppily. In fact, the metal is on one side different from the other. And as a person who's <laughs> used to Apple products and, uh, <laughs> others of the sort, this is not, you know, the, the most beautiful device I've ever seen. Um, but it serves its purpose in the sense that it will buzz you when you move your hand up toward your face. So yeah. I, How is I that can give it credit for that. Like, um, well, I have not, uh, made a whole lot of, of, um, of use of it, but the use that I have so far has been accurate. Um, Although yeah. I think what I'm going to have to do is remove a couple. Let me see. I'll go back to my uh, other scene here. I think what I'm going to have to do is remove some of my um, touch points because it's a little bit overly sensitive. So I've got eyes, nose, mouth, and forehead. And I think I might reduce a few of those because there have been a couple times where upon moving my hand, not near my face, but doing something, it ends up um, affecting, it ends up making that vibration happen. So yeah. Um, I imagine that, you know, it, it, with firmware updates and with updates to the app and stuff like that, this could get better, but from a hardware standpoint, it needs a lot of work. And, uh, it's clear to me that someone thought, let's put a vibration motor and an accelerometer and a gyroscope into a device with a little chip and a rechargeable battery. And then, we can create the service. And so that's exactly what they did. They covered it with glue. They wrapped <laughs> it in a metal band thingy and then they shipped it out. So yeah, uh, so I was not $49. Yeah. $49.99. Um, if I remember correctly, let me go, I'll just go to the site right now just to double check. Um, and so I have to say, uh, I don't think that it's worth the money. Yeah. $49.99. Um, I don't think that it's worth that, that amount of money. I can sort of keep track of my own uh, uh, touching of my face without having to spend that extra money. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. It's like I'm checking out their Twitter feed and it's like they're getting lots of orders and stuff like that. But 
they are a brand new company. So maybe something like the Apple Watch doing it would be a little bit better. Ah, uh, yeah. Can we please get an app that does that? All you have to do is make, well, um, here, listen to me. Uh, one would think that by setting up a complication, then it can keep the app running in the background enough to know when you go to touch your face. So I, yeah. and, and the Apple watch is so much better. I mean, it can do fall detection. So certainly it can do face detection, <laughs> face touch detection. Um, yeah, let's move on to good. not complaining. Let's move on to something that I'm excited to hear. You are getting with the program in terms of your humidities. Yes. Uh, yes. This is very exciting for me because it means I'm cheering with my arms in the air. Um, because I can actually sleep at nights when it's raining outside and not like wake up super sweaty or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I talked about this, I think like three episodes ago because it took a while to ship and then just showed up after our last episode. But I got my dehumidifier and also I keep, I even wrote this in the document. I keep calling it my humidifier and it's the opposite of that. <laughs> and so my girlfriend's always like, wait, did you actually order the right thing? Um, but <laughs> this takes the moisture out of the air because we live in a 100 plus year old Berkeley home that has no ventilation in most of the house. Um, and so when we take a shower, pretty much the steam just goes straight into our bedroom and sits there all day. And then even just having kind of, <clears throat> even just having kind of crummy old windows, like at night, um, a lot of the humidity that comes in from the Bay area, which a lot of people, don't actually know exists because it's it's like in general california and the bay area during the day doesn't have high humidity but at night the water from the bay and the fog and stuff like that can really build up um i think it was up to like 94 percent last night which is the highest it's been in a while but um i was not worried about it because we were <laughs> practically like in a desert of 45 degree humid or 45 percent humidity in a room because we set it way too low um and i was asking you for tips so Oof. like you were recommending higher than that and we definitely uh figure that out in person because it's like we both woke up being like oh god it's so dry out <laughs> um and it was like definitely obvious in the middle of the night so i have now slowly figured out the difference of what it feels like between like 70 60 and 50 and lower humidity, which is kind of an interesting thing to experience. Um, wow. and I have, I got the, I think it's one of the also great picks on the wire cutter for dehumidifiers. It's, it was, it was like 200 bucks, which was a lot, but I pretty much justified it as if I can't sleep for one night and or multiple nights in a row like that a purchase like that is absolutely worth it because i'm not going to be able to do my job or anything like that um so uh i've been using it in tandem with the eve room um the one downside and i'm ashamed to admit on my smart tech show is that it is not smart enabled on its own they do have the sensors and everything so it can turn itself off when it gets just certain humidity but I can't like hook that into Eve's system and turn it on and everything, um, which is unfortunate for me. But I do have the data because that little Eve room is sitting in the same room. And so uh, I, it's actually been really nice. I've noticed that my girlfriend has been like checking the humidity from that little thing on my bedside table. And so we're both slowly building an awareness of like maybe 50. You were recommending 55 to 60 percent, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe for, for I'm, speaking, I might go 55 because I think it goes up in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, for for sleeping, 50 percent is is excellent. Um, for speaking, for being in a position where you're speaking for a long time, uh, 55 to 60 is good. In fact, uh, and here's where the rants come in. So. Here's why humidity is so important. And I learned this from my doctor. Um, and no, it's not, oh, my cousin whose sister was a doctor texted me this new thing. No, no, no. <laughs> this is something I learned a long time ago from my doctor, direct from her mouth. And I remember when I learned it, I said, oh, my God, I have to tell the world. And she <laughs> sort of chuckled. And I said, no, you have no idea. I'm going to I'm going to become the, the uh, evangelist the <laughs> for humidities, um, <laughs> the humidity evangelist. And so... Uh, what folks may not know, and maybe some of you do know, is that our mucus, uh, the, the 
stuff that our body creates uh, when our body feels as if we are dry in our throat or are dry in our respiratory system to sort of coat and protect our respiratory system. Mucus is lightly acidic. That is so that it has a sort of antiviral, antibacterial property to it. But if that mucus stays on those, those, uh, those portions of our body, on those internal structures, because it's lightly acidic, it starts to burn you. And so your throat, um, if you're in a very dry environment and the mucus builds up on your throat and in the back of your throat and you know, throughout your, your, your respiratory system, then it starts to lightly burn you and it creates some irritation that leads to sore throats, uh, post-nasal drip. You have all those different situations that happen. Uh, and so the way to combat that issue of mucus sticking around, staying around is by providing humidity to keep your body from doing that automatic process of trying to lubricate those structures. So you turn on the humidifier if you have low humidity and it keeps you moisturized and it keeps your body from overproducing mucus that then burns those different structures. Um, so when she told me that, I immediately thought, oh my God, I've got to tell everybody. Everybody needs to have a humidifier uh, system. Now, on Math in Matthew's case, there are multiple considerations that he has to make and a reason to have a dehumidifier. He lives in an older home that doesn't have as great of, um, uh, it's not as locked in and, and airtight. And so uh, the humidity from the surrounding space can come in and high humidity, 60% uh, and above, starts to create an environment where uh, viruses, where mold, where mildew and all of those types of uh, bad bad jujus uh, can really start to thrive and, and, um, and recreate <laughs> and overpopulate. So not only do you have the discomfort of being in a humid environment, but you also have the danger of being in a humid environment because it creates a space where those things are allowed to thrive. Um, it, the reason that it makes you, and you know, you know this, Matthew, I'm sure a lot of you out there know, but uh, something that's sort of easy to see whenever you put two and two together, the reason that you sweat so much is sweat is meant to be an evaporative process. Our body sweats and the sweat on our body collects the heat and then evaporates into the air to remove heat from our body. But if you're mm -hmm. in an environment where the air is already saturated with moisture, then you cannot evaporate that uh, sweat off of your body. It stays on your body, and then you get more and more and more sweaty. So that's why people love to talk about the dry heats in uh, Arizona and things like that. Yes, it's 112 degrees, but it's a dry heat. There is some uh, science to that. Uh, however... By dehumidifying, you know, to a certain level to provide for a good level uh, that's somewhere in between, that's fantastic. Something that we all have to keep in mind as we go into the summer months is that AC, air conditioning, that is a dehumidifying process. It is pulling moisture out of the air. And so when you are running your, your AC, you are making your space uh, drop in humidity and then it gets to a place where it starts to cause you to have mucus buildup and, and things like that. I was at the office the other day. There are not a lot of people at the Twit Studios right now because of the social distancing. We're all following those rules. You know, a couple people versus people throughout the day. The AC is still running, but we don't have people in there talking, breathing, moving, etc. that are putting moisture back into the air. So the humidity in the office, last time I was there, it was at 35%. Oh, my gosh. Horribly <laughs> low. Horribly low. I was about to go on uh, to do my show, uh, the, one, the one show that I have to do in person, and I went to walk into the studio and immediately my nose started bleeding. I get yeah, horrible it's... nosebleeds whenever the humidity is low uh, in a space. And so I started ranting, of course, about how <laughs> the humidity was so low. And I had said I was going to bring my humidifier, but I completely forgot about it. But as soon as I got home, I basically cranked that bad boy up and sat by my humidifier and rebalanced uh, out my humidities internally. So yeah, a humidifier and a dehumidifier, depending on where you live, where I live, uh, it's a new build. Um, it's it, it's nice and airtight. I don't have the issue where the uh, rain or anything outside causes more humidity inside. So for me, the thing that I need is the humidifier alone. 
But finding, you know, both of those to reduce um, moisture and not create an environment where it ends up being bad is is fantastic. And on top of that, Matthew, I'm sure you're doing it, but if you're not, uh, you should really, everybody out there, you should clean your humidifier and dehumidifier tanks once a week at the least. Once a week is yeah. good. You don't, you don't really need to do it more than once a week, but once a week for sure. I didn't know that. I had, um, you know, your, your silver, uh, it, it's a, it's a little thing with silver capsules inside that floats around in the tank and keeps bacteria out of it. But even having that, you should still clean out your tanks once a week because little bad jujus can attach to the water molecules that are coming out of your humidifier and going into the air. You breathe those in and then it can cause, uh, there's actually a name, a condition for dirty humidifiers. And I wish I could think of the name right now. <laughs> um, but it, there is a condition that people get where it starts to cause respiratory distress um, whenever you don't uh, keep your thing clean. And in fact, let me see. I've got the article pulled up here. Uh, oh, it's called humidifier lung. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, yeah. Also called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um there is an excellent article that I'll include in the show notes here from the wire cutter called how to clean a humidifier. And if your dehumidifier has a similar tank, then of course you can use that for uh, your dehumidifier as well. But the good thing about a dehumidifier is that it's not taking that moisture and putting it into the air. It's taking yeah. moisture out of the air. So not so much of an issue there uh, with the cleaning. So anyway, yeah. that's my long rant about <laughs> how important humidities are. They're incredibly important for you, and you should absolutely uh, pay attention to those in your home um, and out wherever you are because apparently it's a health risk at work when <laughs> I go to work and have a stinking nosebleed because of how dry it is. Yeah. Well, that's all perfect because that's exactly what I need. I'm even thinking like it's almost – I, I got to move that little Eve room around and test it because I'm almost positive that it's only a problem in that room. Like even the office that I'm in now always feels pretty dry. And again, with a hundred year old home, we don't even have AC at all. And we have one single heater in one room. That's literally like a fire furnace thing. So <laughs> I, I feel like the heat down, it's like super dry downstairs and then upstairs it's like 70% humidity when we got, wake up. So it's it's also it is odd too that it's never affected me before this year. So maybe there's like a certain degree of stress involved with the waking up sweaty part. But it was also like I had my new data like it was like right here. I can see it hit this point. And once it hits 70 percent, I was we also have like a thick almost like Game of Thrones style restoration hardware blanket. And so just mm -hmm. having that on top of me was like brutal. And oh, I've man. slept extremely well since then. So. I'm Good. very, very happy with this purchase. <laughs> that makes me, I'm happy that it's working well for you. And I think that anybody is going to notice a difference. Um, some of my, my dear friends who live, one lives in Arizona, uh, several live in Southern California. And I did the whole um, spiel and pitch to them about humidities. And now they too are humidity evangelists. They all have humidifiers in their home and talk about how it changed the state of things for them as well. So I, I don't know, I'm happy anytime somebody gets introduced to this concept. And uh, I hope to one day talk to that doctor again from um, Columbia, <laughs> Missouri and say, listen, you've changed so many lives. You have no idea. <laughs> uh, so I was I thinking you. that the... Aura ring? I don't, I don't remember how to say it again. I'm going to say it yeah, wrong. Aura but, um, ring. Yeah. That, that was what, like this whole project is what made me think about getting one of those. Because then I was like, well, now <clears throat> I was like, well, now I need to have my internal body temperature at all times measured against this so that I can have like charts of like exactly like for sure this is what happens at what point. So maybe, whole... maybe I will be getting one of those. Yeah, the whole although I don't, I don't want to test not using the humidifier. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the uh, sample tester. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, all right, well, let's uh, round out the show with our picks of the week. I just went on a long rant, so Matthew, tell us about your pick of the week. Sure. Um, this week, I chose to recommend YouTube Premium to people, which is sort of like everybody knows about YouTube, but 
I didn't used to pay for YouTube um, until like a couple years ago. And it totally changed my experience with the platform because basically you're paying not to see ads. And the second you don't see a pre-roll ad before every video, suddenly YouTube just opens up so much where you always are kind of just like fighting against the system of like, oh, I just have to wait for this stuff. And once you start being able to get it ad free at all times and also have it like play in the background once you switch apps, YouTube gets so much better. Um, I definitely recommend, especially if you're just like at home during a time like this, they have a one month trial so you could test it out and then it's $12 a month per person or $18 for a family. So solid family deal. I think I do have like, I think I'm technically on YouTube red, which I don't know if it's even a thing anymore. Um, oh, but that's yeah. what they call it before YouTube premium, which honestly, like the naming is way, way better now because it actually makes any sense. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend it if you're spending a lot of time on YouTube. Um, this actually was prompted because I did a Twitter poll. I was just trying to figure out like, where do people watch YouTube videos? And it was like phone got like 30% and tablets actually got a really high percentage. Um, so I've just been trying to build my own personal habit of like actually getting to my watch later playlist. Um, I don't know about you, but I save tons of videos and then don't actually watch them. So yes. YouTube uh -huh. premium makes that a little bit easier. Um, and also yeah, I'll put a there. link in. <laughs> um, I made a shortcut last November that deep links into your watch later page in YouTube. So you can basically jump right into that list instead of like going and I always forget that it's in the library tab. So it's just kind of like a one tap. You can just ask Siri and go right in, which is nice. Nice. What about you? Uh, yeah. So I, I definitely agree with you in terms of seeing the, the, or rather not seeing ads and how much of a difference that makes. I've, I'm so spoiled in other places, you know, Netflix and Hulu and all those other places where I don't have ads. And so I want it everywhere. So the second I see an ad these days, I'm going, what did I do wrong? What did I forget to subscribe yeah. to? Uh, yeah. Uh, the one that I want to talk about, I, I want to give a shout out to the folks over at Apple. I did talk about this on, um, iOS today, uh, but I wanted to mention it here, and it is a new app from Apple uh, called COVID-19, Apple COVID-19. It's available for free, um, and it is a tool that they made in part, that it Apple made in partnership with uh, the CDC, and it lets you uh, do both a screening um, so if you feel like you might have COVID-19, then it helps you uh, answer some questions to figure that out. But it also keeps you up to date with a bunch of information. So you can learn about what it is. You can learn about the symptoms. Uh, when should I see a doctor? And it has information for all of those as well as, let me close out of that, um, information about what you need to do with washing your hands, uh, what you should know about social distancing, what's involved there. I mean, it is very in-depth. It's a very simple app with little cards that have information about everything. And then it also has a nice link into the uh, section of Apple News that I have shared with my family that is uh, it's a, called Apple News Spotlight. And it has information, the latest up-to-date information about um, COVID-19. Uh, so you get a quick and easy link to that. And you can see it's developed in partnership with the CDC, with the White House, and with FEMA, uh, all of these different things, all of these different organizations. And then, of course, Apple's commitment to privacy uh, is very important and keeps you secure whenever you are using this app in its different ways. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, we'll, of course, include a link in the show notes, but you can do a search for Apple COVID-19 in the App Store if you're on iOS and check out that app. So pretty neat. Uh, and like I said, available for free. And kudos to the folks who worked on this while they were in um, quarantine, social distance, land, etc., uh, we're all, we're all doing it and all still, you know, trying to keep on keeping on. So thanks Apple. Alrighty folks. Uh, this brings us to the end of another episode. If you have questions that you want answered, if you have feedback you want to share, if you have projects you want us to take on projects you're working on that you want to, uh, want to have help with from the, the experts, you can email us. It's simple. It's S T T 
Smart Tech Today at twit.tv. Of course, you can tune in live to the show. We record it every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, 2300 UTC. Uh, if you're watching live, then you can see when uh, the local internet fails us and we have to uh, hop out for a second and get that all figured out. Uh, twit.tv slash live will get you to the live stream. So if you head there on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, then that's when you can check it out. Uh, of course, follow us on social media. Matthew Castanelli, folks want to do that. Where do they go to do so? Um, I recommend people check out uh, my YouTube channel, Matthew Castanelli. Uh, last week, I did a live stream for uh, like 25 minutes about building the new building new shortcuts for the Shazam actions that just came in iOS 13.4. Um, and I like walked people through the whole process of coming up with them and everything was pretty fun. And then even the next day, I actually used my shortcut immediately of, I was listening to the new Dua Lipa album on my HomePod, and I said, show me this video. And that was one of the shortcuts that I made that uses Shazam to identify the song and then gets the video link that Shazam has with it and opens it right away. So it was just like immediately opened into the music video for the song, which was pretty cool. Nice. Awesome. 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 Uh, you can you? follow, uh, yeah, you can follow me on social media at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the things. Um, you can also head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C H I H U A H U A dot coffee. Uh, where I've got links to all the different things that I do. Of course, follow twit on Twitter. That's at twit on Twitter at twit.tv on Instagram, at twittalk on TikTok, uh, where we are posting about some of the fun stuff that we're doing outside of the shows. Of course, we're keeping the shows going, uh, but we're also doing fun stuff outside of the shows. We've done two AMAs so far with uh, some of the hosts of the, on the network, and uh, we're going to continue playing around with that so you can always stay up to date and stay posted. Oh, yeah, there's uh, right in the middle, you can see when I had to go into the studio and got my uh, nosebleed. Uh, this was actually showing how we're following all the rules. He's uh, Anthony, producer Anthony is is more than six feet away from me while we were filming the review for the new uh, iPad Pro. That's a 12.9 inch iPad Pro. I took a photo with there. Uh, so we're still trying to have fun in, in all this time. Uh, please subscribe to the shows on the network, this one and the others. You can head to twit.tv slash STT. We know you're still watching, but it helps uh, to have you download the show. Uh, that makes sure that the sponsors know you're still out there, you're still watching, you're still tuning in, even though you don't have maybe your commute anymore. Um, you do us a service every time you download the show, share the show with others, and uh, have other people check us out. Uh, but until next time, it's time to say goodbye and to say goodnight to all of your smart assistants. Siri, shut it down. Ooh. Darkness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>